Hey, welcome to Christmas at the Movies and to the Hannes home today. I am coming at you from the Hannes home because Pastor Veronica caught COVID-19. And I am so thankful for all the prayers, for all the support, for all the, the things, the goodies that people are giving us. She's feeling a lot better now, but we're filming this from home because we wanted to be safe and make sure that Discovery is a safe and secure, sanitized place. In fact, some of our volunteers and staff have also got COVID and they are isolating in place and, um, and their loved ones are as well. And I'm honestly, I'm surprised that this didn't happen sooner with all the ministry we do, the outreach, the food, the people that we're in contact and we're serving and ministering to in this season. Um, we've been very fortunate and blessed up to this point. And honestly, we're continuing to be blessed. Even, even now, we're so blessed to continue to serve God. And even though we're here and we're isolating for now, um, our church doors continue to be open. And that's something that we want to continue as much as possible. That discovery is going to be a place that offers hope and healing and light in the midst of darkness in this season that is very dark. For a lot of people. So I'm grateful for your prayers. I'm grateful for your support, but rest assured we are doing the safe uh, thing. And we are going to um, be in this place until our doctors release us. Could be as early as, you know, next Sunday. Could be by Christmas at Discovery, most definitely. So we're excited about this series that we're in, though. And I'm excited to continue this teaching series with you. For those of you that are joining us online or at our Dream Center or even at our Discovery Bakersfield campus, I am so excited. I hope you are ready to jump into the next movie that we're going to be studying. We actually began the series last week. If you missed it, we did The Grinch and we talked about the size of our heart and how the power of God can transform our heart. And not only that, not just begin a transformation, but even heal the wounds and the pains that we have from our past. He can truly transform our heart. Today, we're going to jump into another Christmas classic, one of my favorite all-time Christmas movies, Home Alone, 1990 classic. Man, I was just a, a little kid back then. I don't know how old you were or what you were doing back then, but that was a long time ago, and it's still to this day. I love watching it over and over again. Kevin McAllister, he is a kid that has no filter at all, always getting himself in trouble. And the movie begins with him doing just that. He gets himself in trouble. And honestly, it's kind of his fault, maybe a little bit of other people's fault. His mom puts him in the attic. And through some unforeseen circumstances, he gets left home alone and the family travels off on vacation. And when you think about Home Alone, maybe you think about you know, the last 20 minutes of the movie that that is all the booby traps that Kevin does to the wet bandits, you know, and, and you think about all the crazy stuff that they went through. Um, or maybe you think about the uh, adulting that Kevin McAllister had to go through. Like you had to actually shop for groceries. They didn't just appear by themselves. He had to actually go shop or he had to bathe uh, correctly and bathe the spots that he kind of missed before. And, or, or maybe you think about him in the aftershave famous scene where he puts the aftershave on and he screams into the camera. The reality is I think that Home Alone is the perfect Christmas story. It's a great picture of the story of Christmas. Home Alone, the entire movie from beginning to end is actually all about hope. And isn't that the, the story of Christmas? It's all about hope. Hope of what is to come. Hope that is coming to the rescue even now, even today. A hope of a better tomorrow or of what could be. You know, in our season, in our uh, challenges, and our circumstances that we're all faced right now, there is a lot of hopelessness. When we look at what we have and what maybe we don't have, I think a lot of people are feeling hopeless. But hope, you guys, comes from something so much bigger than our current circumstances. Lamentations chapter three, Jeremiah writing this. He says, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of context. Jeremiah is writing this in the middle of when the Israelites were just defeated, enslaved, exiled, I mean, persecuted. This is a, such a difficult scene and circumstance that they are in. And he writes, yet I still dare 
to hope. I love that phrase. And I dare you, despite what you're experiencing right now, today, in your family, in your circumstance, I dare you to hope. He says, I can do this. I dare to, I can dare to hope because I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. You see, my hope isn't in that stuff. It's in the love of God. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. In other words, this world can be taken from me. Money can be taken from me. Relationships can come and go. That is not my inheritance. The Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I can have hope. I put my hope in him. Now, the biblical definition of hope is this. Hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised. So when we say we're hoping for something, we're not saying it like, like maybe other people or the world or maybe even you've used it in the past. When we say hope, I'm talking about a confident expectation of what God has said he will do. What God has promised will come to pass. What God has written, it is mine. What God has promised is yes and amen. We have his promises for this life, like the life we're living right now, and we have his promises for eternal life. I love what Titus says in chapter two, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. I love that. I don't know what you feel like today. Maybe you feel like you're discredited or disqualified from God or by God or other people, but you need to know that the grace of God, that unmerited, undeserved favor is available to every single person. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinless pleasure. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Look at this. While we look forward with hope to a wonderful day. So it's easy to, to get hopeless and feel defeated uh, when I look at the evil world. When I look at our, my current circumstances, when I look at the world around me, it's easy to get hopeless. But the Bible says that's not where we look. We're looking beyond today. We're looking beyond my circumstance. I'm looking beyond that. I look forward with hope to the wonderful day when the glory of our, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. But here's the problem with hope, you guys. We're really good at hoping for things that will not actually give us the desired outcome that we desperately need and even want. We put our hope in things that just can't do it for us. And that's where we find Kevin at the beginning of our movie. Check out this clip. Now, let me just say, if your kid talks to you like that, you need to memorize Proverbs 13, 24, okay? Whoever spares the rod hates their child. Whoever loves their child whoops their rear end. That's the, the real version. I'm just kidding. That's my version of it. I don't know about you. I mean, you can go with the whole you know, time out thing, or I'll send you upstairs thing, but I'm going to follow the Bible anyway. Anyway, I, I digress. We can all relate to Kevin in some ways though. I think we've had maybe some people that torment us or really irritate us like a buzz, or maybe you've been in circumstances where you felt like no one gets me, like nobody gets me. Write it down like this. Number one, we all have misguided hopes. We all hope for the wrong things. And Kevin, he really wanted relief from the situation, but he interpreted that and said and thought, I don't want my family or don't need my family. And I kind of just want to pause right there for a moment and speak to families that maybe in this season of, of challenge or crisis, maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel like, you know what? I don't need this marriage. You know what? I don't, I don't need these parents. I don't need this family. And I'm telling you, that is a misguided hope. Um, misguided hopes will never satisfy. They may satisfy in the moment, but they will never bring lasting joy. You know why? Because hope is only a staple as what it's secured to. Let me say that again. Hope is only as stable as what it is secured to. You may have hope in things, but we just have misguided hopes. You, you may have had a hope of that the right person or a person was gonna be in the White House or a party was gonna be in Congress. Sure, you had hope, but when it's not your person or your party, <laughs> you melt down. And most of the time on Facebook, 
okay? So misguided hopes, we all, we all have them. And Kevin here has some misguided hope. And it's actually the primary plot of the entire movie. It sets the stage for the rest of the movie. And similar to us, I think when we have misguided hopes, it kind of sets the course and the stage of our entire lives. It's what happens to us. Jeremiah 17 and 9, I read this to you last week. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Some of the worst advice people can give is follow your heart. And I think I understand what they mean by that, but honestly, here's the problem. The Bible says our heart is sick. Our heart can deceive us. The only way following your heart is good is when your heart is following God. That is the only way. When your heart is aligned to his heart, then we can follow it because our heart is set on God and God is setting its course and guiding us. Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, for there is going to come a time when people won't listen to the truth, but will go around and looking for teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. See, we're good at following after our own desires, our own wants, our own needs, pursuing what we want. We all have misguided hopes. And when we get what we hope for, much like Kevin, immediately we will experience joy, we'll experience happiness, and he goes wild. You know, he made his family disappear. He doesn't have to worry about buzz anymore. He doesn't have to worry about people eating his cheese pizza. <laughs> he doesn't have to worry about anyone picking on him. He thought he had it made, but he found out that his misguided hopes come with a cost. Check this out. So we all have misguided hopes. And number two, misguided hopes can bring unexpected pain. For Kevin, the reality of his hopes coming true um, meant that he had to grow up and take care of himself. He realized that food doesn't appear, laundry doesn't do itself, um, and at night, loneliness started to set in. Even though he didn't enjoy some of the moments with his family, after they were gone, he longed for them. For Kevin, it was his family and loneliness. That's what the pain he experienced. But for us, it could be a bunch of different things depending on what we're putting our hope into. We may put our hope into you know, a pay raise or something and, and you, you anchor your soul to that and you put your hope into what that can provide for you. But then the cost of that, the pain, the unexpected pain could be, um, you know, you have unexpected health problems. Uh, your health deteriorates because of it. Or maybe there's problems and trials in your family and your marriage because of that promotion in your job. Or maybe you put your hope in something you want to buy or purchase or a home or a car and say, this is what I really need. And, and then the pain of the debt and the financial strain and the stress and everything that follows that hope that we're putting in. See, it's not that those things are bad. Those, those things aren't necessarily bad things. They're just not good sources of hope. In fact, Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, you may believe you're doing the right thing, but the Lord judges your reasons. Did you catch that? I mean, you can think that you're doing the right thing. You may even have your heart, your, yourself fooled because your heart's deceitful that you're making it for the right reasons, but God actually looks at the heart. So, someone might believe that their motive is pure when they help their neighbor, yet their real motive might be to feel wanted and appreciated. Others feel virtuous because they're hardworking, but it might be just a cover for their perfectionism. Another might believe that they're friendly and easygoing, but their genuine reason for all that may be just to avoid conflict at all costs. Some pride themselves on being creative and constantly having new ideas, but their motive might be just to avoid following through on previous ideas. Some whitewash over failures because of the unconscious desire to appear successful. See, that's why we have to align our hopes with God's heart. But hope deals with the unknown. And every time that there is an element of the unknown, the enemy will play on that and he'll, he'll pull some strings of fear because of the unknown. And throughout the movie, we can see how fear is used to disrupt the hope. Check out this next clip. There's some good theology in that clip right there. 
Fear had kept Kevin from starting a relationship with old man Marley. But when he faced it and broke that barrier, he started to experience freedom in that area, just like in the basement with that fireplace. When he faced it, he broke that barrier and he was able to experience freedom in that place. And then old man Marley, he's afraid of reaching out to his son because of what his son might say to him because of the last words that they had exchanged in the past. So he's, because of his fear, he's not even talking to his son and he forfeits years of a relationship for fear of what his son might say to him if he reached out. Here's the third thing that I want us to realize. Number three, fear often keeps us in our pain. See, the devil uses fear as a weapon, but I want you to know that God has not given us that spirit of fear. Now, now fear itself is, it can be useful, but the spirit of fear, that fear that paralyzes us, immobilizes us, the fear that keeps us in our pain is not from God. That is from the enemy, from hell itself. God has not given us that spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. See, fear focuses on you, but faith focuses on God. Fear, it focuses on you. Here's, here's two areas where we, get, where we get our hope kind of misguided, even taken from us, where we experience hopelessness and fear. There's two areas that we begin to focus on, I believe. Here they are. Number one, we focus on our problems. Our problems. These are the things that you really can't control. They're out of our circumstance. Like it's, it's this whole year. It's 2020, okay? It's, you know what? I got sick. You know what? I, this happened and I just don't get it. God, you didn't come through for me when I thought you were going to come through for me. That person died and I really thought you were going to heal them. God, I don't understand it. God, if I'm being honest, it's hard for me to have hope because of the problems I'm experiencing. This is the, the rear view mirror syndrome. You know, it's like you're trying to look ahead and make something out of this life, but you're stuck looking in the past. You're stuck looking at the resume that screams at you. All the things that have ever happened, your problems can really, really consume you with fear and take your hope, make you feel hopeless. Here's the other area, not only your problems, but your mistakes. Okay, because the, the problems I didn't have control over, but the mistakes, those are all me. That's just the dumb stuff that I did, the stuff I wish I could take back. You know, when you look back and you go, man, I wish I wouldn't have said that. I wish I wouldn't have done that. And a lot of us, we feel trapped by our mistakes that we made in the past. And it causes us to lose hope and be consumed with fear. And it almost feels like you, like you can't unscramble eggs. You know what I mean? Like, like you might make it a little bit better, but there's no going back from there. You can't unscramble the eggs. The truth is, a lot of us feel like our mistakes are unforgivable, like God can't forgive us and can't redeem that. And that's a lie of the enemy, but some of us feel that. And even if he can, it's almost like, well, the thought of it's still there, so what's the use? Listen, you have to shift your focus from you, your problems, your mistakes, to your God. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says this, And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy, because we can now experience. Did you catch that? This isn't wishful thinking or blind optimism. We can now grab hold of something. This is tangible. I can experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. See, God has a plan and a hope for each of us, and he never disappoints. Yeah, sometimes we get caught up. We get chasing the wrong things, but God's endless love never stops. Even when we don't see it, he is hard at work. I, we can be confident that God is working behind the scenes. And one of the great things about this movie throughout the whole story is behind the scenes, Kevin's mom and family are working desperately and relentlessly trying to get home back to Kevin. Even though he was rude, even though he had a bad attitude, he said some things that were mean, he was ugly, he was disrespectful, uh, he said some things he regrets. She will stop at nothing to get back home to her son, even if it means riding in a moving van with some polka misfits. <laughs> Check this scene out. Kevin was clueless to the fact that his mom and his family 
We're desperately trying to get back home to him. Here's the reality. God is working hard behind the scenes for you right now. You may not see it. It may not feel like it. And it may, your misguided hopes may have produced a lot of unexpected pain in your life. But I'm telling you right now that the misguided hopes will not overshadow God's plan for your life. Write it down like this. Number four, God has a bigger plan than your pain. Misguided hope may have taken you through some unexpected pain and your fear that you're experiencing may be paralyzing you in that situation. You may think like it's never going to go away. It may feel like that, but God's plan is greater than your mistakes. God's plan is bigger than your problems. Jeremiah 29 and 11 tells us this promise. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. See, God has plans for your life. God has a hope for your life. Will you choose it? Will you stop pursuing lesser hopes, lesser things, misguided hopes, and choose the plan of God for your life? See, the, the, plan, the pain that you're experiencing may be real, and the pain may be great, but God's plan is greater. And I can tell you without question, in, without a question in my mind, that God's plan is greater than any pain that you're experiencing right now. Some of you have made a mistake, or you have a big problem. And it's causing your hope to evaporate. It's causing you to experience a lot of fear and it's paralyzing you in your present, maybe even paralyzing you in the past. But I'm here to tell you today that God's plan, should you choose it, this is something you can choose. It's available for all people, this grace and this hope. If you choose it, God has a better plan and a bigger plan. He has a plan that's filled with hope. He wants to prosper you. It's filled with hope and a future. Hey, will you choose that today? Can I pray for you right where you're at, at the Dream Center, in person, at Discovery, or online? Will you bow your head with me right there? Some of you today, you're experiencing the pain of your prob of problems that you didn't start, or maybe mistakes that you've made, and you need to lay those down today. The best way that you can lay it down, really the first step in all of this, is surrendering the control of your life to Jesus. I'd love to pray for every one of you in just a moment, but can I start with those of you that today that God's plan, when I talk about God's plan, like you're not living that, you know it. Just in your heart, you know, like you're living your own plan. Maybe it was a misguided hope and you put your, your hope in a lot of things that, that did not really give you the outcome you desired. And, and God's revealing that to you right now by his Holy Spirit. I'd love to pray for you right where you're at to Surrender your life to God, to, to surrender your plans for his plans. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. You'll get a fresh start right here, right now. You're one prayer away. I'd love to just pray for you right where you're at, watching this online or sitting in the audience. If that's you, and you're ready for a fresh start, you're not gonna like come up to the front or single you out or anything like that. I'm just gonna pray for you right where you are. Here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna count to three. And if you're in person, on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand. If you're online with me right now and you're watching on the count of three, I want you to type in the chat feature, I need Jesus. And someone is gonna pray for you and reach out to you. But if that's you, come on, be bold with me. Choose God's plan. Choose, choose a better hope. One, two, three. Come on, I need Jesus right there. I'm so excited for all the decisions that are being made right now. If that's you and you raise your hand, go ahead and put it down. If you type that in the chat, will you pray something like this with me? Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my misguided hopes, my mistakes, my past. Today, I surrender the control of my life to you. Jesus, I declare you're my Lord, my Savior. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, I pray over every person right now that's hearing this message by design, by destiny. God, we're surrendering our lesser hopes right now. 
God, forgive us for chasing wild fantasies and dreams. When you have a, an amazing plan and purpose for our life, God, no longer are we going to be pulled astray by this world. We're laying everything down and we're following you today. Thank you, God, for delivering us from fear, from the problems of this world, from the sting of this world, from the mistakes that we've made. Draw us closer today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, if you received that word today, will you just give God some praise right where you are? If you're in person, celebrate with us right now. Come on, give God some praise. Man, I'm excited for what God is doing in your life. If you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ, uh, you got some next steps before you go. Give me a couple more minutes before you guys turn loose on me. There's a connection card in the back of the seat if you're in person. If not, there's gonna be something coming on the screens or inside the chats for you to click a link or text for you to fill out an online connection card because we want to connect with you more than just kind of preaching at you. I'd love to know your name. I'd love to pray for you by person. If you gave your life to Christ today, there's a spot on the connection card that says that you did that. Check that off. Make sure if you're in person to go see our information center um, at the Dream Center or at Discovery Bakersfield. We'd love to give you a gift today. If you're visiting for the first time, we've got a gift for you as well. And if you gave your life to Christ, there's a special gift for you at our information centers. Make sure you go grab that before you go. Today is a special day at Discovery Church. We're gonna worship God in our giving right now. And there is some offering envelopes that should be in front of you, but you have a unique bulletin that was given today that says all in. It is our annual um, offering Sunday that we call All In Sunday. One day, one Sunday out of the entire year, towards the end of the year in December, we dedicate the entire offering to go towards an area of mission. And this year, God has called us to take a huge leap of faith. He has called us to purchase this property that we're currently sitting on, the building that we're meeting in that we've been leasing for almost five years now, and the laundromat next door, and turn that into our Discovery Kids Center. And we'll actually be having our private Christian school operating out of there as well. There is so many things that God is gonna do on the horizon, and 100% of the offering taken up today is gonna to go towards the purchase of this property and the renovation for our kids center, worship center, lobbies, and getting this campus ready for the harvest of post-COVID. I know it's coming. We're so excited about what God is gonna do. For those of you that don't know the story of this land, it's a miracle that we're here on this property. But this land was actually owned, it was part of the Billy Graham Foundation. From the very beginning of this land, the people that owned it thought and believed that it was holy, that God had a special plan for it. This was years and years ago. And actually it was preserved and protected from other businesses and, and things and enterprises to do business here because the people that held and stewarded this land believed that a God-honoring institution would be here on this property. And that's why they called the laundromat His Waters because they said this is His land and His waters. Um, and they didn't know, but God saved this. For years, He saved this property for Discovery Church so that we would be able to build on this place, reach the loss in this place, that we would be able to raise our children in the Lord, in this place, that I believe this place in Bakersfield is going to be a springboard of church planting and missions across the world. And I'm excited that we get to partner together with it. Now, you have been praying, a lot of you, for weeks now about this day. If you're with us today, right now, and this is your first time, I'm excited you're here. Don't feel obligated to give. This is something that's for the family here at Discovery. If you want to give, please feel free to give. What we've been saying, though, is obedience is our responsibility and the outcome is God's. And we really believe that. And as we pray and, and ask God, what do you want us to give? What do you want us to sow into the soil of this ground, of this purchase, of, of the legacy of Discovery Church? And we just obey with that, the outcome is God's. And I know you've been praying. I know you have an amount that's already ready. You can start to get that ready right now. But there's a few things inside that a bulletin that I wanted to draw your attention to. Because some of you are here today and, and you're part of the family and, and you even 
give to discovery, but maybe you don't tithe consistently. And can I have just a moment to speak to you about that on the very first Sunday of December? For us, the first Sundays here at Discovery are, are they're the first fruits, and it's an opportunity for me to lean in to the first Sunday and teach you about the power of first fruits and the power of the tithe. And I wanted to take an opportunity and actually put a card in there called the Tithe Challenge. For some of you that maybe don't tithe consistently or you've never really taken that step of faith with your finances and given God control of that area of your life and honored Him and trusted Him at His word, I want to challenge you to take the tithe challenge. Here's what the tithe challenge is. The tithe challenge comes from Malachi chapter 3. The Bible says that we can test God in this area, that if we return the tithe to the storehouse, which is your local church, the place where you get fed, if you return that tithe to the storehouse, then God says, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing in your life that you won't be able to contain it. Here's what I want you to do. If you're ready, and now this is no arm twisting, but if you know in your heart and your spirit that, that this is your next step of faith, that your next step in following Jesus and trusting him is in the area of your finances, then this challenge is for you. I'd love for you to take out that card and fill it out and say, you know what, I'm taking the tithe challenge. What we want you to do is over the course of the next 90 days to test God and give him the tithe, the first fruit, the first 10% of all your income, test him at that and just see if your life is not better after 90 days, whether that's emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, like, like just if God is not faithful in, in, in providing for you, just test him at that. Take him at his word. Now, now this is not my challenge and it's not my test. It's God's. God told you to test him in this. He, he said, he's drawing, putting, bringing you to the carpet saying, hey, come on, test me in this. I dare you almost to try to outgive me. And so if you're ready for that, I'd love for you to fill out that card let us know, because over the next 90 days, we'd love to shoot you some resources, some uh, doctrine and, and, and information about ties and, and finances to help you get this area of your life under the covering of God. What I'd love for you to do is take your envelope, take your all-in commitment, take that tithe challenge. Will you do me a favor? And with that, will you just kind of stand with us? We're gonna give you an opportunity to take that to the back of the church on your way out in just a moment and give on your way out. We're not gonna pass the baskets down, but what I wanna do is have a moment of worship where we just give God some praise for what he's going to do. I believe God is going to pour out so much blessing and he's gonna multiply the resources that we're sowing today, whether we're online, in person. I believe God is gonna do that. You have some links that you can click. If you're watching online, you can give with us and sow into the soil of discovery right now. And we would love to partner with you in reaching people. So come on, will you one more time? Let me pray for your offering. Let me pray for this, this purchase that we're about to make in this property. And then we're going to worship God together. God, we thank you for what you are going to do in this place through Discovery Church, that this huge faith step, God, you are taking care of it. Lord, all we have to do is obey and trust in you and the outcome is yours. So God, I pray that you would multiply these gifts, the offering that are being presented. God, I pray that you would continue to fill us with faith that we would believe you for great things, that we would trust you in every area of our life, including our finances. God, this is a miracle, supernatural faith offering right now. God, we are trusting you with these resources that you are going to multiply and provide. God, that we would be able to purchase this property and renovate to get ready for the harvest that is coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.